So, I was talking about that uh, that town I lived in with the martial artists and gym guys, and I wanted after I became a private investigator after I was in the army. I still met the gym guys and the martial artists. So I was in. Uh, I went to Hollywood right after I got out of the army because I was going to go to this Qatar Institute. And uh, so I went to Hollywood. I found a cheap hotel. They were supposed to get me into housing. And uh, in the, at the school, they, they were like, well, we didn't talk to you. I was like, I called you three times. You know, I talked to you. I was all set, ready to go. And they're like, well, I would have remembered. You didn't talk to me. And then I was like, okay, now this guy's denying even talking to me. You're like, what the hell? And then, uh, so all that fell through. They were supposed to find me a job according to the guy. And they'd help me with housing and all that stuff once I got there. And uh, there was a whole process of getting into the school. Of course there is. But every other school is like simple, straight, easy, get, you know, you get right to the exam. You got you have this guy, like, you know, I don't know what he's going on in his mind. Being in Hollywood, I guess, you know, they're f- whatever. And, uh, you know, I just wanted to go to guitar school for a year before I go back to work because I had been in the Army, I had to think about war, everything else, and I uh, knew if I go right back to work, I won't play guitar because well I wouldn't have time to go to school to learn more about guitar and I'd taken only four lessons when I was younger and I'd learned a lot about guitar but I put it down for so many years it's like algebra I forgot I could still play from knowing remembering how to use my hands and my ears but I didn't know what chord was a b B flat, whatever, this, that, you know, or scale. I remember the scales, kind of, but not what scale it was. And uh, I had such a weird style playing guitar. Because I liked blues, and then I had a friend who was into heavy metal, and I ended up playing like a blues metal type style. Because I'd hear that when he would play his heavy metal. I didn't listen to heavy metal. Some of the guitarists, like Ying, Ying Wei Malmsteen, I used to like listen to him because he was such a skilled guy about guitar. And then uh, Steve Vai, a little bit of Eddie Van Halen, but I had the same name Edward, so I didn't want to listen to him. Um, and he was Dutch, and my family was Dutch. And I want us to too much Eddie <laughs> I uh so I I don't know I uh but I got the blues from Jeff Healy I, I used to listen close my eyes Jeff Healy was a blind blonde guy and uh, played blues back in the 80s and 90s. And I uh, I would, like, close my eyes. I'm, like, 17. I'm, like, close my eyes trying to play blues, trying to be like him, blind, see if I could do it, too. And then uh, it's kind of a tarred blonde thing, I guess. See the blonde guy blind, see if I can do it, too. But, um, that's funny. Uh, teens are weird. Uh, so then, anyways, in, the guy that taught me, actually, I was getting ready to talk about, uh, you know, what happened up the army, but I, uh, the guy that sold me my first guitar was, well, 
I had a cheap guitar, but it wasn't like really all that playable. And then um, when I was first learning, and then my first like decent guitar was like an Epiphone with a Charvel neck. But the guy that sold to me was a black belt in martial arts. He was a blonde guy too. Uh, I worked with, he was a cook, I was a dishwasher. And then like I got a promotion to be a cook trainee and he sold me a guitar and then he rented me my first place. I, I just turned 18 and he rented, he had like a, a mobile home out on by this farmer's orchard with no mailbox or anything like that or a real address or anything. And, uh, but he had, he owned it. And um, he goes, you know, I don't stay there. Uh, you know, all he wanted to charge me was a hundred dollars a month plus whatever utilities. And then, um, so I thought, well, that's decent, you know, hundred bucks a place to stay. And it was my first place. It was out in like this town with one store. It's a small little town, Calusa, California. But now it's like bigger. They got a casino there and everything. Um, I was living in Yuba City and then moved out there. I played guitar and and his guitar got ripped off. Um, then I moved back to Oregon because my dad was like, I was getting ready to go to college. My dad said, hey, go to college. But it the reason I was saying it, <clears throat> it was a martial arts thing. The guy was on steroids, though. He, he was like using pill form steroids. But he was a good guitarist. He played like, kind of like Eddie Van Halen style. I didn't hear him sing, but he was a singer too, I guess. There was a, a guy at the restaurant. It was a Best Western Bonanza Inn. And uh, had like a country American steakhouse. And you know, it was like one of the waitresses, she had like a 500 acre ranch uh, her husband did. She just liked to come into town for something to do. She worked as a waitress at the, the, the Bonanza. And uh, he was a country guy, the cook. And then, like, the manager, one of them was, like, this German lady, this old German blonde lady. And then uh, the other was from England. I lived in the same apartments as my mother. It's a family-owned thing. One of the dishwashers was nephew of the owner of the place, and there's just a motley crew. But one of the singers in the bar, he was the house musician. He kind of looked like Roy Orbison. He had black hair, you know, but he'd sing Roy Orbison songs, and he sounded pretty close to Roy Orbison when he'd sing him. He's really professional, and. Um, so he sang pretty good. He checked out the guitar when I bought it. He said, yeah, it's a good one. So I bought it. That was my first one. But, you know, because of rock and roll, I stopped playing. I, I just, because I would just sit in my room and play, and I'd go to guitar lessons, and I had painting lessons, and I'd paint or play guitar on my days off when I had time. Or go fishing or go ride my bike by uh, mountain bike or 10 speed. I can't remember what I had. And, um, you know, I just had kind of a uh, pretty set regimen in what I would do because there was a small town. There wasn't a whole lot to go do. I'd go for a long drives up in the, in the wildlife refuge or I'd go fishing at the wildlife refuge and you know, learning to drive. I'd speed around on the back country roads. And one time I hit this berm. I went up over this berm. Kind of kind of a cliffhanger thing. And this little red Honda Civic. You know, learn not to speed around corners. And then... Uh, but I made it down. <laughs> I used to play this game called Cliffhanger. And there was this laser thing on there. And, uh, or it was a laser, I'm sorry, laser thing. It was, it was a laser, it was the very first, like, realistic graphic video games were the laser games, and Cliffhanger was one of them. And you'd move these joysticks, 
and then it would make like a scene like a role play type deal and you're this guy and uh, there was a car like just like the car I had and you'd speed in it would go up this berm and I did that before just like on Cliffhanger I don't know if anybody's from the 80s and remembers Cliffhanger <clears throat> and uh so okay I'm gonna ditch that and anyways I got out of the army I was in Hollywood and um so all kinds of motley people there. But I ended up around uh, meeting this guy from Oregon. And he was like managed by Snoop Dogg's uncle. He was an artist, a uh, rapper, white guy. And then uh, I started driving. He had DUIs and he had like a flyer business, putting out flyers for nightclubs. So I drove him around and stuff because, uh, you know, I didn't want to leave right away. And, and um, school thing, it fell through. But I wasn't sure what I was going to do yet. I have to go in there. And then um, he ended up getting a job as a, a gym manager. Plus he had the flyer business. And so I would drive him over to one of the guys that got him the job at the gym manager's neighborhood and they had poker parties and then I would go visit like this guy that, that had the poker parties he was like a fifth degree in karate and he called in the house because he was a really big guy he had like 300 pounds and um, he worked at like double A but he's, he used to tell me he had a uh, he won a world champion in an exhibition match and he couldn't get a title belt. But his career was over on that. And um, they were just playing neighborhood pork parties. But so I was around like gym guys again. Then And then I had another job. There was two gym managers. One had used to be a gym manager, was friends with the guy that was a gym manager and they were doing like some kind of thing for the electric company that he was getting money for. And um, so he'd go to doors and, and put get people signed up for the electric company on this low income discount electricity deal. And they get like $5 a, t a person you sign up. And um, did that in like East LA And, uh, so I did that and then, so I met, you know, gym guys and um, I met this one guy and he was at, at the labor hall because I needed some money and he had been in a, he was a backyard fighter and he had 149 wins, zero losses in backyard fights but couldn't fight anymore, so he had to work at a labor hall because uh, George Bush uh, anti-terrorist thing, the, the Homeland Security, busted all of the promoters for the backyard fighting uh, for terrorism, so he couldn't get a fight. And then, uh, but he is like telling me he did Uzi shootouts, Used a flamethrower in a fight. All kinds of stuff. So that's why they busted him. <clears throat> so they weren't sports fighting that way. <clears throat> like some of the guys that might get known. But he was a huge dude. I mean, he was like six, seven or anything, but he was just like, his muscles were like, you know, he had a lot of muscles. I was working with him. We were doing some hard labor. It was hot. Took off his shirt. His muscles were all over the place. They weren't bodybuilder muscles. He was just some brute guy, you know, real strong. And 149 
backyard fights. And he was a nice guy. I talked to him. He was decent. It's like gonna murder you or something. But I I went from I met some more guys in Chinatown. I met I was in Chinatown. I had canned a lot of things, and I was in Chinatown. Went to a little convenience store, and uh, was going through my thing. And uh, I bought. I was going in to buy some something at the store, and this this guy walks up. This African American guy. He walks up to me, and he goes, you know, kind of whispered to me, "Hey." Can I get you to buy me a sandwich? You know, I'll buy, I'll pay you back, you know, tomorrow. And um, I said, sure, but don't worry about paying me back, you know. And so I bought him a sandwich and uh, something to drink. I bought whatever, you know, a meal. And so he's like, well, just meet me at this restaurant over here. I'll buy you lunch. And um, so come to find out. He told me, I met him, and uh, he said um, he had he had uh, gotten in an argument with his manager on the job, and um, his manager spit on him when he was talking to him. The spit flew out of his mouth, so he spit back at his management manager. And so the manager shut him out. It was a nationwide labor, like day labor, tempera, people ready or something. And um, he got shut out from that, the whole nation's labor ready for spitting on back at him. <laughs> and so he was shut out on that. And uh, that's why he was out of money. He was living in a hotel. And uh, so all that. I uh, come to talk to him, and um, I met up with him. I kept meeting up with him each day. We would take care of business, and do things. I would go with him. He had to go here, and he'd go with me. I'd go there, or whatever. And then uh, comes to find out he had seven black belts in kung fu, and his nickname was Dangerous D, and he was. One of Portland's main suppliers, I think, in the in the eighties or nineties, for cocaine, and he got busted by uh, the police chief's son. I think he sold dope to the police chief's son or something. And the police chief knew who he was, so he had been he was off parole. He had been out of jail and off parole, and um, he made it off all that. And uh, he was doing fine. And, but the police chief made it really hard for him to get jobs, he said. I don't know if that was paranoia, but. Um, so that labor hall thing really hurt him. And, um, but he taught me Kung Fu. Like, he, he showed me how, how to, uh, break guys' arms and stuff, and um, said, you know, this is probably, probably going to help you fight a bigger guy, you know, so he showed me some combination kung fu stuff that he used if a guy was bigger than him, and then uh, how to fight more than one person, how to pivot around, you know, and stuff, and, and um, so, and then he corrected some of my, like, punch way a punch and different things I had not like refined you know and uh, took some of the taekwondo stuff that I had in my head out he said you don't want to use taekwondo and all the things that way whatever I don't know I think most of it was just my own mind because I had like been in dojos for a whole lot I, I just being a, a school wrestler since I was a little kid everything was like I just learned fighting move and I figured I know it because it wasn't all that hard to use or I wouldn't use it I just figured it was worthless to me but 
those guys go over and over and over and over again. I, I don't see the point. Barehand fighting. You know, you know, why make yourself do it every day just to learn it? And then you get in a fight and you go to prison. <sighs> but I learned, I learned a bit of a little bit of a lot. Yes. So I've been done grappling. I done checked that out a little bit to see. I wanted to go over chokeholds because uh, the army had guys I knew do the military guys learn a lot of chokeholds, and um, some of them that's all they learn. It's just the choke from choking you. Went over a little bit of the Muay Thai stuff, some JKD, some stick fighting. Um, but I don't know. I feel really dangerous too after that arm break and stuff. It's real easy to do too. You know, I just you don't think of doing it, you know, until you figure it out. Someone shows you. Getting a lot of trouble, I guess. But so I, I learned that stuff. I was just, you know, I always going up. So and then there was also this guy whose father was a cop, and he's around with with us, and he like saved some guy from getting, uh, killed by a car that was driving by. The guy was walking, getting ready to walk around. He grabbed the guy, pulled him out of the road, and then. Um, a guardian angel guy. He was like the instructor for the guardian angel martial artists and was there, witnessed it, and was like, hey, you know, you, you really should consider coming over and being our, you know, coming over and uh, sparring and, and seeing about becoming a guardian angel, you know, and we could test you and see if you're what you know. And, um, so then he went, did that a little bit. He was thinking about doing it. His dad was a cop and stuff, but it didn't. I don't think he want. He said that he didn't just didn't want to do it. He didn't, there's something about it he didn't like. And then he said because his dad was a cop, he just knows that guardian angels are different. You know, he, he just his dad taught him different way to li to be to live and. Some of those guys are anti-cop, and his dad was one. He seemed like it. And so, but his dad, I guess, was, like, really hard on him. He said his dad, when he was a kid, he would take him to the park to go fight some other guy's kid. I don't feel like cop or, you know, probably cop or National Guard or somebody's kid, town, fight instructor's kid or somebody. And... They'd go have their kids fight like pit bulls. And then if he lost, his dad would beat him. And um, so so they're taking their boys out to fight them like pit bulls. And, you know, so that, that happens, I guess. You know. Never, thank God it didn't happen to me. And... Uh, Then uh, he said his dad one time he took him out fishing and threw him out of the boat and uh, made him swim for a mile before he let him back in. He was really rough on him. Yeah, it's just a kid, you know, when you're a kid, that would freak me out. Dad throwing out, no, oh, dad, no, oh, dad, let me back in the boat. So. He had a rough life. I don't know, maybe. Your life's rough. I don't like how I explain I had to explain, and you know, it wasn't all that easy for me either. But uh, that's that's America. You know? <laughs> a lot goes on. I guess you don't live in one of those affluent neighborhoods, kind of incubating. 